We're afraid you might laugh at us. I'm not laughing. What is the purpose of this autopsy? You believe a, a monster lurks in each of us.
He too has no heart. Blood feel. His heart is dried up. It doesn't feel, doesn't live, doesn't beat.
Perhaps you'd better not watch, Williams. I did not heed him. Would that I had, and so spared myself the dreams that invade my sleep even yet. I stood at the window behind him and watched what went on in that room, for the smell of smoke was now permeating the house. Mrs. Potter, or what animated her gross body, started up, went awkwardly to the back door, retreated to the window, retreated from it, and came back to the center of the room between the table and the wood stove, not yet fired against the coming cold. There she fell to the floor, heaving and writhing. The room filled slowly with smoke, hazing about the yellow lamp, making the room indistinct, but not indistinct enough to conceal completely what went on in the course of that terrible struggle on the floor, where Mrs. Potter threshed about as if in mortal convulsion, and slowly, half visibly, something other took shape, an incredible amorphous mass, only half glimpsed in the smoke, tentacles, shimmering with a cold intelligence and physical coldness that I could feel from the window. The thing rose like a cloud above the now motionless body of Mrs. Potter and then fell upon the stove and drained into it like vapor. The stove, cried Professor Keynes and fell back. Above us, out of the chimney, came a spreading blackness like smoke gathering itself briefly there. Then it hurtled like a lightning bolt aloft into the stars in the direction of the Hyades, back to that place from which old wizard Potter had called it into himself, away from where it had lain in wait for the Potters to come from Upper Michigan and afford it new host on the face of Earth. We managed to get Mrs. Potter out of the house, much shrunken now, but alive. On the remainder of that night's events, there is no need to dwell. How the professor waited until fire consumed the house to collect his store of star-shaped stones. But the reuniting of the Potter family, freed from the curse of which is hollow, and determined never to return to that haunted valley, of Andrew, who, when we came to meet him, was talking in his sleep of great wounds that fought and tore in the place by the lake of Holly where they live in glory forever. What it was that old wizard Potter had called down from the stars, I lacked the courage to ask. But I knew that it touched upon secrets better left unknown in the races of men. Secrets I would never have become aware of had I not chanced to take district school number seven and had among my pupils a strange boy who was Andrew Potter.
most paralyzing terror. Though the golden light of late afternoon gave the ancient roofs and decrepit chimneys an air of mystic loveliness and peace, I could not help glancing over my shoulder now and then. I would surely be very glad to get out of my low wrists and fear shadowed in's mouth.
shadow in the attic. One. My great uncle, Uriah Garrison, was not a man to cross. A dark-faced, shaggy-browed man with wild black hair and a face that haunted my childhood dreams. I knew him only in those early years. My father crossed him, and he died. Strangely, smothered in his bed a hundred miles from Arkham, where my great uncle lived. My aunt Sophia condemned him, and she died on a stair by nothing visible. How many others might there have been? Who knows? This is more than whisper fearfully of what dark powers were at the garrison's command. And how much of what was said of him was superstitious gossip, baseless and malicious, none could say. I never saw him again after my father's death, my mother hating her uncle then, and until the day she died, she never forgot him. Nor did I, either him or his gambling group house on Aylesbury Street, in that part of Arkham, south of the Miskatonic River, not far from Hangman's Hill, in its wooded graveyard. Indeed, Hangman's Brook flowed through his grounds, wooded too, in the cemetery on the hill. I never forgot the shadowed house where he lived alone, and had someone in by night keep his house for him, the high-ceilinged rooms, the shunned attic which no one entered by day, and into which no one was permitted ever to go with a lamp or light of any kind, the small paned windows that looked out upon the bushes and trees, the fanlit doors, the kind of house that could not fail to lay its dark magic upon an impressionable young mind, and it did upon mine, filling me with brutal fancies and sometimes terrifying dreams started awake and fled to my mother's side, and one memorable night lost my way and came upon my great uncle's housekeeper with her strange, emotionless, expressionless face. She stared at me, and I at her, as across unfathomable gulfs of space, before I turned and sped away, spurred by new fear imposed upon those who gendered in dreams. I did not miss going there. There was no love lost for us, and there was little communication, though there were occasions on which I was moved to send Uriah Garrison a short greeting, the old man's birthday or Christmas, to which he never responded, which was as well. It was, therefore, all the more surprising to me that I should have inherited his property and a small confidence in his death, with no more annoying provision but that I inhabit the house for the summer months of the first year after his death, which he had known clearly as a teaching place. In my tortured ears, there sounds unceasingly a nightmare whirring and flapping and a faint distant baying as of some gigantic hound. It is not dream. It is not, I fear, even madness, for too much has already happened to give me these merciful doubts. St. John is a mangled corpse. I alone know why, and such is my knowledge that I am about to blow out my brains for fear I shall be mangled in the same way. Down unlit and illimitable corridors of eldritch fantasy sweeps the black, shapeless nemesis that drives me to self-annihilation. May heaven forgive the folly and morbidity which led us both to so monstrous a fate. Wearied with the commonplaces of a prosaic world, where even the joys of romance and adventure soon grow stale, St. John and I had followed enthusiastically every aesthetic and intellectual movement which promised respite from our devastating ennui. The enigmas of the symbolists and the ecstasies of the pre-Raphaelites all were ours in their time. But each new mood was drained too soon of its diverting novelty and appeal. Only the somber philosophy of the decadence could hold us. And this we found potent only by increasing gradually the depth and diabolism of our penetrations. Baudelaire and Huysmans were soon exhausted of thrills, till finally there remained for us only the more direct stimuli of unnatural personal experiences and adventures. It was this frightful emotional need which led us eventually to that detestable course which even in my present fear I mention with shame and timidity. That hideous extremity of human outrage, the abhorred practice of grave robbing. 
do was to whisper the amulet, that damn thing. Then he collapsed, an inert mass of mangled flesh. I buried him the next midnight in one of our neglected gardens and mumbled over his body one of the devilish rituals he had loved in life.
years old had not helped to make the place popular. Isolated among strange influences, Lavinia was fond of wild and grandiose daydreams and singular occupations. Nor was her leisure much taken up by household cares in a home from which all standards of order and cleanliness had long since disappeared. There was a hideous screaming which echoed above even the hill noises and the dogs barking on the night Wilbur was born, but no known doctor or midwife presided at his coming. Neighbors knew nothing of him until a week afterward, when old Waitley drove his sleigh through the snow into Dunwich Village and discoursed incoherently to the group of loungers at Osborne's general store. There seemed to be a change in the old man, an added element of furtiveness in the clouded brain which subtly transformed him from an object to a subject of fear, though he was not one to be perturbed by any common family event. Amidst it all, he showed some trace of the pride later noticed in his daughter, and what he said of the child's paternity was remembered by many of his hearers in years afterward. The only person who saw Wilbur during the first month of his life was old Zechariah Wakeley of the undecayed Wakeley's and Earl Sawyer's common law wife, Mamie Bishop. Mamie's visit was frankly one of curiosity, and her subsequent tales did justice to her observations. But Zechariah came to meet a pair of Alderney cows Bishop of the undecayed bishops mentioned having seen the boy running sturdily up that hill ahead of his mother about an hour before the blaze was remarked. Silas was rounding up a stray heifer, but he nearly forgot his mission when he fleetingly spied the two figures in the dim light of his lantern. They darted almost noiselessly through the underbrush, and the astonished watcher seemed to think they were entirely unclothed. Afterward, he could not be sure about the boy, who may have had some kind of a fringed belt and a pair of dark trunks or trousers on. Wilbur was never subsequently seen alive and conscious without complete and tightly buttoned attire.
the woods were not feared half so much as the small island in the Miskatonic, where the devil held court beside a curious stone altar older than the Indians. These were not haunted woods, and their fantastic dust was never terrible till the strange days. Then there had come that white noontide cloud, that string of explosions in the air, and that pillar of smoke from the valley far in the wood. And by night all Arkham had heard of the great rock that fell out of the sky and bedded itself in the ground beside the well of the Nahum Gardner place. Sometimes, when it is cloudy, I can sleep. Well do I remember the night of the great aurora, when over the swamp played the shocking coruscations of the deep night. After the beams came clouds, and then I slept.
paper tacked to that frightful canvas in the cellar. The thing I thought was a photograph of some scene he meant to use as a background for that monster. <laughs>
Springs. Would you believe a movie audience guide presented as a public service by this theater's management to help you select your motion picture entertainment?
the animalistic, the monster that lies within each of us.
the shuttered room. One. At dusk, the wild, lonely country guarding the approaches to the village of Dunwich in north central Massachusetts seems more desolate and forbidding than it ever does by day. Twilight lends the barren fields and domed hills a strangeness that sets them apart from the country around that area. It brings to everything a kind of sentient, watchful animosity, to the ancient trees, to the briar-bordered stone walls pressing close upon the dusty road, to the low marshes with their myriads of fireflies and their incessantly calling whippoorwills, vying with the muttering of frogs and the shrill songs of toads, to the sinuous windings of the upper reaches of Muscatonic, flowing among the dark hills seaward, all of which seem to close in upon the traveler as if intent upon holding him fast beyond all escape. On his way to Dunwich, Abner Waitley felt all this again, as once in childhood he had felt it, and run screaming in terror to beg his mother to take him away from Dunwich, and Grandfather Luther Waitley. So many years ago, he had lost count of them. It was curious that the country should affect him so, pushing through all the years he had lived since then. The years at the Sorbonne, in Cairo, in London, pushing through all the learning he had assimilated since those early visits to grim old Grandfather Waitley in his ancient house, attached to the mill along the Miskatonic, the country of his childhood, coming back now out of the mists of time, as were it but yesterday that he had visited his kinfolk. But nothing could erase that final cataclysmic knowledge seared into his mind, the key to which he had had all along and not known it, the knowledge implicit in his own memories, as well as in the notes Luther Wakely had left, the chunks of raw meat he had childishly supposed were going to be prepared in on Sari's room, instead of to be eaten raw, the reference to R, who had come back at last, after having escaped back to the only home R knew, the seemingly unrelated references also in his grandfather's hand, the missing cow, the sheep, and the remains of other animals, the hideous suggestion clearly defined now in those entries of Luther Waitley's about ours, size commensurate with the amount of food, and he must be kept on a careful diet and to a controllable size, like the Innsmouth people, controlled to nothingness after Sarah's death, with Luther hoping that foodless confinement might shrivel the thing in the shuttered room and kill it beyond revival, despite the doubt that had led him to a Jewer Abner to kill everything in it that lives. The thing Abner had unwittingly liberated when he broke the pain and kicked out the shutters, liberated to seek its own food and its hellish growth again, at first with fish from the Miskatonic, then with small animals, then cattle, and at last human beings. The thing that was half Batrachian, half human, but human enough to come back to the only home that had ever known and to cry out in terror for its mother in the face of the fatal Holocaust. The thing that had been born to the unblessed union of Sarah Waitley and Ralsa Marsh, spawn of tainted and degenerate.
snakes can to the bleeds. I wouldn't sleep with top the fence, then put the chain link to my teeth. Don't bother talking if I cannot hear your chains clink when you breathe. Fuck yours, go vacant as the pockets of the vagrants in the streets. Huh. I'm pure the snakes can to the bleeds. I wouldn't sleep with top the fence, then put the chain link to my teeth. Don't bother talking if I cannot hear your chains clink when you breathe. Fuck yours, go vacant at the pockets of the vagrants in the streets. Put yourself through death, double up and bruise dance. Strike a bow with pack with a brick house. Nigga, fuck your two cents, didn't come with new sense. Could be Russian roulette on the sixth round. That discussion proves best, but it's busting through vests. Couldn't fucking groom zest out of this child. It's not my job to make a bitch proud. Shut the fuck up and sit down. Shut the fuck up and sit down. Yeah, yo, it's gonna Take a shot of one with me, I'm like, you hold the heat. That's golden leaf, what I chose to be. Broke the mold and leak the old belief. I make sure you showed up like a post for peanut. Kids rolling grass. Now I want to roll the weed up, living cold in sack with any hope to leave self dry. Lips cracked by the private slaps when I spit in the face of those who told the reason, huh? I'm pure the snakes can to the bleeds. I wouldn't sleep atop the fence, then put the chain link to my teeth. Don't bother talking if I cannot hear your chains clink when you breathe. Fuck yours, go vacant as the pockets of the vagrants in the streets, huh? I'm pure the snakes can to the bleeds. I wouldn't sleep atop the fence, then put the
unreasoning killer.
Because I've got a touch that makes men's souls combust. How do you keep the weight off? People always ask the stupidest stuff. How do you keep the weight off? How about I don't want to talk about it? Forget it, I cast bad vibes on you. Do you know how it feels when the sun won't shine off? Let the first recorded words of my adult life go as follows. Yeah, I've got some extra veins, I've got some extra nerves, I'm hoping 
they heard the morning routines getting started all around kitty camp, waking him up in the process. With a small sigh, he hopped out of bed and began putting on his clothes, consisting of a pair of pink Daisy Duke shorts and a too small tank top. As he looked at himself in the mirror, Kim smiled again as he looked as he always did, a little girly kitty boy.